Welcome back to another episode of the Dr. Supercoach YouTube. You're on again with Pig, and it's time to do some digging. Some pigs dig for truffles, but I dig for big captain scores, so let's go. Last week was interesting, with two of the most popular VC choices going over 150, being Bont and Dacos. If you got on them, you probably had a good week. If you missed them, you were probably a bit disappointed. I had Caleb Sarong as my captain, and it wasn't great. He managed a ton, but it did have me regretting not going for Dacos as my VC, which was my consideration. And last week, I did say that there weren't going to be many popular players going big. And really, aside from Bont and Dacos, it was pretty average on the captaincy front. But that is not the case this week. There are some very good players with some very favourable matchups. So let's discuss them. My number three VC option is Marcus Bontempelli. The Bont was the top scorer of the round last week, putting up a monster 186. After putting the Bulldogs on his back in the fourth quarter, I believe he had an 82 or 84 point last quarter. He was monster. And that was against the Collingwood midfield that had been fairly restrictive up until then. Well, now he gets a test against an even more restrictive opponent in Brisbane, again at Marvel Stadium. And I did highlight it last week, and I'll highlight it again. Bond is averaging 129 points per game at Marvel this year. And quite a few of those have been against restrictive matchups. So he's doing really well at Marvel. Can he do it again? I wouldn't bet against him. The harder matchups, the possibility of attention from Dunkley, and the likely return of Ed Richards and maybe even Libba, they do dampen my expectations a bit here. I'm not expecting a monster one, but Bond has one of the best ceilings in the game, so he's always a great VC option. Then my number two VC, we go to Dane Zorko. And what an enigma Dane is. Two scores over 160 in his last four matches, but a measly 66 in his last game. An old body with an injury-prone reputation. But as long as Zorko is healthy and playing as a defender, he's just got to be in our VC consideration given his ceiling. This week is no exception as he plays against the Bulldogs. And the Bulldogs are a positive matchup for defenders in general, but they're especially fruitful for opposition-designated kickers. And the Lions want the ball in Zorko's hands, and I feel like this is a really nice matchup for them to do that. Add to the fact that Brisbane have a really incredible record at Marvel Stadium, giving them a really good chance to win. I, last time I checked, I think Bulldogs were favourites, but I really wouldn't be surprised if Brisbane win here. Uh, and the closed roof uh, of Marvel Stadium generally benefits those kind of good kicking and marking players. So I think this one's a really sneaky high upside VC that I don't think many will be considering, and I think that might be a bit of an oversight. Then my number one VC recommendation, and this might sound controversial given what he just did, but it is Jordan Dawson. Jordan, Jordan, Jordan. One week his owners want to kiss him, the next they want to kill him. Scores of 94, 142, 107, 158, and then 55 in his last five games. They just pound the picture of the roller coaster it's been. So, can his owners trust him again? I think they can in this one, given the extremely favourable matchup. It would take a brave owner to use the VC on Dawson, but I will tell you why I think you should do it. First up is the venue, Adelaide Oval. Jordan Dawson averages 116 points per game across his entire career at, the, at this venue. That's a massive average from 35 games. There aren't many players that you know, average over 116 at a venue that they've played at 35 times. There's no stadium that he's played five plus games at that goes even close to that average. So this venue, Adelaide Oval, is Jordan Dawson's stomping ground. Then there is the opponent, the injury-riddled Richmond Tigers. Richmond is the second easiest matchup for inside midfielders, and they've been a matchup that we've been targeting to great success this year. I do believe that Jordan Dawson will be playing an inside midfielder role now with the Matt Crouch injury, and I expect to see a bit of a bump in his scoring over the second half of the year if he does kind of get more CBAs and go into the midfield more. But even if he doesn't, well, Richmond are also the easiest team for forwards to score against too, and by a huge margin. So if you're a forward, you want to be playing against Richmond. So even if Dawson does play the same role as previous weeks, the matchup's just too juicy to ignore. Dawson scored 127 against North Melbourne and 158 against West Coast, playing that same half high, high half forward role. 
and I put Richmond in the same boat as those two. Not only that, but let me read you Jordan Dawson's scores at Adelaide Oval this year. He's got a 94, a 96, and a 99. They're his lowest. That's not a bad floor. But he's also got a 142, a 158, and a 168. They are big, big scores. And I think this could be another one to that to add to that big, big score list. So not many people will be VCing Dawson after his stinker last week, but the data suggests that this will be a huge bounce back game. Now there's obviously the concern that he's carrying an injury, a bit of a niggle, might not play as much. You know, that that's a concern, but that's why you use a VC on him. Like I would not be recommending this guy as a captaincy, but a VC with a high upside, just have a ping. Then my point of difference could be a vice captain, could be a captain. With these buy rounds, you've got blue dot non-playing players that you can throw the captaincy. You could VC right up to the last game nearly. So Brody Grundy is my pod VC or C. And so my pod recommendations, they have been flying recently. A Max Holmes 133, a Jordan Dawson 158, a Dane Zorko 161. So let's keep it going this week with the jellyfish man himself, Brody Grundy. I went back through my records and I noticed that I recommended Grundy as a pod VC in round eight and he pumped out a 143 for us. The reason that I recommended him then was because he was playing an easy opponent out of a favourable venue. Well, guess what? This week he plays an easy opponent at a favourable venue. So let's talk about opponent first. Over the last five games, Geelong are the third easiest opponent for opposition Ruckman. If we could narrow it down to games that just Toby Conway has played, I think that would be even easier. Um, but that's not something we can do with on DFS. The reason? Well, Toby Conway only wins a hit out in 33% of his Ruck contests. That is by far the worst mark for any player that is averaging over 65 Ruck contests per game this year. That means that Grundy will have Plenty of access to hitouts to advantage, clearances, and score involvements due to having control of the ruck contest. If you want some more data, no premium ruckmen have played against Conway in the last three weeks when he's been solo ruck, but those that have, Nankervis scored a 117, Briggs scored a 97, and even Moyle scored a 104. They've all easily outscored their season average in the last three matches against Geelong, so... None of those are premium ruckmen, and they've still put up, you know, well over a hundred average. Which you guessed it, all had Toby Conway as Geelong's main ruckman. They're not at Brody Grundy's level. Brody Grundy's going to destroy this man. But that isn't the only reason I love Grundy for this matchup. Across his decorated career, he has played at the SCG ten times for a career average of one twenty nine. Who averages one hundred and twenty nine from ten matches at a venue? And this year is going even better than that. He's actually averaging 131 at the SCG this year versus 92 away from the SCG. They're just insane numbers that cannot be ignored. If you want even more convincing, Grundy is averaging 49 points this season when coming off a rest the following week. If I owned Brody Grundy, I would absolutely be slapping the VC on him. And if you missed it, I talked on the Dr. Supercoach podcast this week about why I project Brody Grundy to be a better R2 than English and Marshall for the remainder of the year. It does come down to those guys having a buy, so Grundy plays an extra game. But if you miss that, go look at our Route 12 recap for Dr. Supercoach podcast and you can see why people that don't that haven't sorted their R2 yet, you'll see why I'm recommending Brody Grundy and I think they're going to get a massive sugar hit this weekend. And if you trade him in and vice captain him, I think you're going to be flying high. So <clears throat> big, big wraps on Grundy from me this week. Then we'll go to the captains. And like these guys could be vice captains as well. Like I said, you're probably going to be able to loophole nearly anyone. So you could even VC Sunday, like the last game Sunday, because then there's a Monday game you can captain into. So uh, number five captain option will go to Sam Flanders. Sam's been a model of consistency for us this year, and that has been sorely needed in the forward line. He's actually got no scores under 100. He's also got no scores over 130, but that is just as reliable as it gets. And sometimes you want that in a captain. A safe 120 is incredibly valuable. And I think Flanders gives you that again this week. Although I think he does have the chance for a little spike score. Playing against the Kilda, 
They're one of the easiest matchups in the league for opposition designated kickers. And I expect the ball to be in Sam Flanders' hand a lot this game and for him to be taking advantage of this matchup. One thing I do want to note with St Kilda, we've kind of been expecting our premium defenders to dominate against the Saints. Like we've kind of, well, I have Vice-Captain Luke Ryan, Vice-Captain Jeremy McGovern against the Saints, hoping for a spike from our premiums. But what I noticed, that isn't really happening. Those premiums still have like pretty good scores, but it's more the lesser defenders that have really good games. So for West Coast, it was guys like Barris and Witherden um, that kind of lifted their game. For defenders, it was, uh, for Freo, it was more like Jordan Clark and Chapman. So it's like the premiums still have a good score, but they're not having the giant spikes that we really hoped. It's more like the other defenders around them all raise their level and kind of St Kilda just seems to be, you know, a, a giant, like a big floor game for everyone. So that's probably why they still look like a really good matchup on DFS even though they're not, you know, giving up the big spike scores, they're just letting all defenders do really well. So I guess that's how I want to look at St Kilda now. So if we look at it from that point of view, I think this Flanders matchups may be one of the safest captaincy recommendations I will have all year. It might not be the big spike score that some are hoping, but I think this is just uber safe. Then we go to number four is Chad Warner. The chat has been on fire in recent weeks and he deserves to finally make his debut in my captain's video. Looking back at his last four games, he scored 199 against two of the hardest matchups in the league and then he popped a 172 and a 144 against teams that are a neutral matchup. So they weren't easy and he still smacked them. So what happens when he plays against the easiest team in the league for inside midfielders to score against this year? I mean, it could be a bloodbath. There have been some gigantic scores against Geelong this year, including Anderson scored a 149, Rao scored a 128, Wine scored a 157, Butters scored a 147, and Oliver scored a 141. And that's only going back a few weeks. I, I didn't even go back and kind of look at the first six or seven rounds. Can Warner be the next midfielder to join that list? With the form he's in, I would not be betting against it. In addition to this, they play at the SCG which with its smaller dimensions, it is known to be a higher stoppage ground than most. Chad has only really had the one or two, yeah, no, he's only had the one big captaincy worthy score at the SCG, but it was also his most recent, that 172 two games ago. So this one, it isn't necessarily about a pick, about picking a player who has destroyed this matchup before. It's more about picking one of the hottest form players in the game against the easiest opponent in the game at his home ground. I think this is a really good one, especially for a VC. You could kind of have a a high upside Chad Warner fling, Um, but I do think he's a pretty safe captain as well. My number three option is Nick Dacos. Nick Dacos is looking like one of the best players in the competition right now, with a five-round average of 138 and a season high of 156 last week. He was my number one VC recommendation last week, But even I was surprised by that monster score. I just wish I had uh, listened to my own advice and VC'd him. But I think he can do well again this week against a Melbourne team that are the sixth easiest matchup for inside midfielders over the last five games. So Melbourne, uh, they're in in the third of easy. Uh, They're in the the easier third of matchups. They they were actually one of the easiest matchups, but the last couple of weeks they have put a little bit of a, a break on. And my only concern is here that I expected Caleb Sarong to destroy Melbourne last week, and he didn't. However, Nick Dacos playing on a public holiday in a standalone game with the whole country watching it has a different vibe to that matchup, though. This guy always stands up on the big stage, as you can see from his recent performances when a medal is on the line. 128 on Anzac Day this year, 145 on Anzac Day last year, and 118 in this corresponding King's birthday match in 2023. Another thing going for Dacos is his history against Melbourne. He's only played them three times in his career, scores of 118, 129 and 112. This should be a really simple captaincy option in the last game of the round, captaining a player in red-hot form against an underperforming midfield with a medal on the line. I just think this is really safe. Then my number two option is Isaac Heaney. So Heaney's last month of footy, combined with his recent buy, 
may have some people forgetting the force he was early in the season. Scores of 144, 136, 128, 148 and 165 in his first five rounds. That is what he can do. And it's probably what I expect him to do in this game if he isn't tagged. Now that is a risk with Geelong. There is always the Mark O'Connor or Mark Blitzar's tag risk. They don't tag all the time. In fact, they rarely have this year. But, you know, the other game recently against GWS, they tagged Tom Green with Blitzar's. So it's always a risk. But Heaney still scored 165 when being tagged by the Eagles in round four. He's just so damn good. And if the Cats just let him run loose, look out. This could be a monster. Much like I talked about with Chad Warner, the extra stoppages at the SCG should lead to more chances for points for the Swans midfielders. And against the easiest matchup in the league, that can only be a good thing. I fully expect one of Chad Warner or Isaac Heaney to pop a 140 this week. The question is, which one? Or it could be both. I'll be looking to use my VC on one of them and try and get on the train of whichever one is just dominating. Then my number one option, rounding out the week, rounding out the last game, really, really good fallback option, and I wish he played earlier so I could VC him and just take the score, but it is Max Gorn. Max has been a yo-yo in recent weeks, and I expect a bounce back this week. I've already talked many times this year about targeting a team's captain after they themselves were poor and their team lost and then came under heavy media scrutiny. I've mentioned that a few times, and last year, Bont and Merritt were two that I targeted, and they gave me giant scores in bounce-back games. Even this year, I've already used this theory twice with Gorn. Now, you can't do this with every team captain. There are guys like Alex Pierce or Jai Simpkin who aren't really that super coach relevant, so it doesn't work for them. Guys like Jordan Dawson and Connor Rosie, I don't really see them as having that angry lead from the front, put the team on my back mentality. But Max is. He ticks both of those boxes. So he's my poster child for the uh, the captain putting the team on his back after a spanking and leading them to a win, which when people do that, they usually produce a big super coach score. Max has already done it twice this year. Look at round zero. He scored a 72 and he got beaten by Grundy and his team lost. The next week, revenge game, he scored a 162 and led Melbourne to a win. Then in round 10, he only scored 109 and he, like you could say he got beaten by Bailey Williams. And his team lost. They went over to Perth and they lost to West Coast, absolutely crucified in the media. Well, he responded with a monster 180 and he led Melbourne to a win. Will it happen a third time? I think it could. He scored 95 against Frio. He got beaten by Sean Darcy. Melbourne suffered a humiliating loss. Off the top of my head, I think I heard someone say it was the worst, the biggest loss in Simon Goodwin's tenure. Everyone's just questioning whether Melbourne are even very good. That just makes my eyes light up for a bounce back Max Gorn game here. But it's not just that, it's also the venue and the opponent. Max is averaging 140 points per game at the MCG this year. That's massive. Even before that, it was one of his most profitable profitable venues. And there's the then there is the opponent. Darcy Cameron, without Mason Cox, has always leaked points to opponents. This year, Cameron is winning the hit-out in 43% of his ruck contests. That's not bad, but it's not anything compared to Mason Cox wins at 50%. So that means that Collingwood are an easier matchup when Cox is out. Case in point, English scored 131 on them last week, and Sean Darcy scored 113 on them the week before, and Cox did play a bit of that game, so it's not like that was fully Coxless. So... This has been a long-winded explanation to say, I think Max Gorn will have a point to prove this week and he will bounce back. He'll bounce back at a venue he scores well at against an opposition that give up lots of points to Ruckman. So I've been confident in Max Gorn a lot of times this year and this is absolutely one of them. I think this is a monster score. My moves, I'll be looking to vice-captain one of the Sydney boys into a Maxi Gorn captaincy. I haven't decided if it'll be Heaney or the Chad yet. I might, I'll have a bit more of a think about that. I'll probably go for whoever I think has the highest upside or ceiling because I'm just so confident with the Max Gorn safety that I don't really care if they fail. I just want to want to go for the ceiling. If I own Dawson, I would think about it quite heavily if we find out he's playing and healthy. 
If I own Grundy, that's probably actually where I'd go with the VC. There's something a bit special in uh, VCing Grundy into Gorn, I reckon. A bit of the old set and forget of the old days, the throwback. So if I own Grundy, I'd be doing that. But uh, just given that juicy matchup, that's incredible for, for Gorn and Grundy. So as always, that's me done this week. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Jump over to Twitter. Follow me at pig underscore DRSC. Have a chat to me in Slack if you're in there. Uh, and I'll catch you next week.